Okay, welcome everyone. Wonderful to have you all here. Uh, welcome to the first Ammonia Energy Live or webinar. Um, Ammonia Energy Live will be a monthly series to explore the uh, wonderful world of ammonia energy and the role it's going to play in our global decarbonisation efforts with an Australian twist. So joining us today we have Trevor Brown, Executive Director of the Ammonia Energy Association and he's based in New York. Trevor's going to be interviewed by Andrew Dixon from the Asian Renewable Energy Hub Project as well as Darren Jarvis from Instech Pivot. Um, Andrew and Darren are both founding members of the of AEA's Australia Committee. Uh, we encourage you to submit questions during the webinar via the questions box in your go-to menu. Uh, we'll try to answer the easy ones as we go or if time gets short and the question is a good one we might save it for a future webinar. We're keen for this series to answer your burning questions and address the topics that you're keen to hear about so please keep the feedback coming. If you can't make one of these events at its a scheduled time please don't worry just register and you'll receive a link to watch the recording shortly after the event finishes. We're still deciding a place for all these event recordings to live and be easily accessible and there'll be more on that next month. Without further ado I'll hand over to Andrew to kick us off. Thanks Julian. hello everyone um, thanks for joining us. So to kick things off um, Trevor could you, um, some people out there may not be aware of who you are and your role in this industry so can you just tell us a bit more about yourself um, and how you came to be involved with both ammonia, ammonia energy and the AEA? Sure sure well thanks for thanks for inviting me to um, to talk. Um, so I, I um, I'm a theatre producer originally. My uh, my 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 work was um, in London and New York, uh, putting on plays and musicals, and uh, that's what brought me to New York. I had an off Broadway musical that ran for ran for six months over here, and um, about ten years ago, I became very interested in climate change, and I was looking for things um, to do about that. Uh, and so naturally, I, I, I ditched theatre and retrained in finance um, because that's the the logical conclusion to climate change and um, and while I was doing that a friend of a friend um, needed some help with a with an investment pitch deck for a startup they had on uh, an electrochemical ammonia synthesis technology and uh, this was my first real exposure to um, to ideas of ammonia synthesis and, and the ammonia industry um, but uh, it was extraordinarily interesting, and I thought, well, you know, if you could, um, if you could work on this, nobody's talking about this. This is this is like uh, one percent of of global GHG emissions. That would be a great thing to to achieve if you were trying to make a difference in climate change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, other people can deal with the with the wind and the solar and the batteries and all of those things. You could just say, focus on the, this one percent that is ammonia. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a, a a huge number. Um, I stumbled across the, uh, uh, back then the Ammonia Energy Association was called the NH3 Fuel Association and um, I began volunteering for them. I, I did all of their marketing, their website, uh, organized the conferences um, and uh, was, was joined the board of directors. Um, and as we moved forward, um, you know, we relaunched the, the association in, in 2018 as a industry association instead of a, a sort of academic membership organization and um, and we, we hired me as the executive director to to build it up and push it forwards. So I'm, I'm really curious like when, when did the light bulb go off in your mind as it has with mine subsequently that ammonia can move beyond fertilizer and become a form of energy when did that light bulb go off for you? Well that was um, that was really you know once I'd met John Holbrook um, John was was the founder of the Ammonia Energy Association. He was the the champion of solid state ammonia synthesis um, electrochemical technologies, and um, and so you know in many ways he's he's my mentor of of all of these ideas. This this entire um, movement was was uh, put on the map uh, to a, to a large extent by the efforts of John, um, and um, I've spent um, I spent the next sort of Five or six years trying to stop focusing on this. Um, you know, I, I, I kept trying to to walk away and do other things that were that were going to pay me, um, or, 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 
you know, be, be more useful in those ways. Um, and every time I tried to step away, something fantastic would happen. So the, you know, the first time I was like, ah, I don't know how much more time I can devote to this. You know, the Clinton Climate Initiative gets involved. Then I'm kind of, like, oh, great, let's stick around a bit longer. And then the Clean Air Task Force starts committing to this. And then, um, you know, the SIP Energy Carriers Project and, 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 and Department of Energy. And it just sort of snowballs and it becomes really just impossible to step away. Yeah. So... Uh, Trevor, when um, when you're thinking now about ammonia, what do you see as the importance of ammonia in the global energy trans transition? Sure. So, um, well, if we forget about ammonia for a bit, and we just talk about the energy transition, we, you know, this is all about climate change. So we, we're trying to we're trying to um, not just reduce; we're trying to essentially eliminate emissions. Um, and so the way to do that is you're going to electrify. You're going to electrify everything you can. Um, and once you've done that, you're going to realize that there are some, some things that even though electrification is the most efficient way to use energy, you, ju you just can't electrify. Them. So you're going to have um, uh, things like steel that you can't electrify. You're going to have things like um, container ships you can't electrify it just the energy density um the, the 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 chemical processes don't don't work uh and so at that point you're going to turn electrons into molecules so you're still electrifying them because you're making the molecules from um electricity um they're they're, they're going to be um you know renewable molecules um but it's not direct electrification uh, so it's a much, much less efficient process, and you're only going to do it when, when, when you need to, when you can't directly electrify. Uh, and the first molecule you're going to make is hydrogen. And if you can stop at hydrogen, you should. If you can use hydrogen directly, uh, and if you can use it immediately, um, then, then you should use hydrogen. It's a lovely, lovely molecule. Um, but it's, uh, it's very hard to store, and it's very hard to move. So if the application you have is one that needs to move, or one that, that needs to have a duration. You know, if you, if you, uh, I say, if you're trying to move it through time or space, um, then hydrogen ha has lots of limitations. Um, and at that point, you're going to make your hydrogen molecule into a, a, a slightly more complex molecule. Maybe it's going to be ammonia. Maybe it's going to be methanol. Uh, there's lots of uh, there's lots of alternatives here, um, but ammonia has uh, has certainly become one of the very prominent ones. Um, with the with the tremendous advantage that it doesn't contain carbon so if you're gonna if you're gonna go into a combustion process you're not doing a whole bunch of direct air capture to make a hydrocarbon with all of the immediate um atmospheric emissions going straight back out in a in a little circular very expensive circle um so you've got an, you've got a, a, a what, what becomes a renewable energy commodity we don't have such a thing today T today our energy commodities are are coal and LNG. We don't have a renewable one, one that we actually made. Um, and so this is this is a whole new future for energy markets that that hasn't really existed before. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a question of very, very large scale niches. So if you think of like uh, maritime shipping as a niche, uh, you know, it's a niche that's bigger than today's global ammonia production. A very, very big niche. And we're going to have a series of very big niches um, that we didn't need to solve until now because we were busy laying down the, those early renewable energy projects and those first hydrogen projects. Uh, and I always say that, you know, if, if, um, if what you want is a hydrogen fueling station, you should build a hydrogen fueling station. If we want a network of 20,000 hydrogen fueling stations, you should build it with ammonia. And so, Trevor, I mean, clearly you've been part of this kind of journey for a fair while now. Um, there must have been sort of key inflection points, key things that have happened that have accelerated this. So can you paint the picture from what you've observed in the last decade? Well, I think the, I think the most, um, the single most influential thing has to be the, the Japanese SIP Energy Carriers Project. This was a, a government funded, um, but academia, industry, government cooperation, um, 10 phase R&D project that looked at how to import, because Japan is, a, is an energy importer. So how do you have a hydrogen society if you're an energy importer? Where's all that hydrogen gonna come from? 
And so they were looking at um, liquefied hydrogen. They were looking at um, liquid organic uh, hydride, so, um, so LOHC, uh, the, the toluene uh, methyl cyclohexane um, options. Um, and uh, they were also looking at ammonia. Those were the three, the three um, energy carriers that they, that they were assessing. And what they discovered was that ammonia was uh, essentially the cheapest way to bring in huge quantities of, of hydrogen. Um, but the more they looked at it, the more they realized that if you didn't have to crack the ammonia back into hydrogen at the end, you'd have an even more advantageous um, energy import system. Uh, so that that that's the that's the biggest um, sort of uh, inflection point when when that became yeah as as it became published uh, all of the different pieces of research but um but there's been a, a number that the Siemens green ammonia demonstrator um, outside Oxford where you can um, really go and actually kick uh, a, a green ammonia plant and it's just one wind turbine feeding a feeding a green ammonia plant that then feeds a storage tank and then feeds a internal combustion engine so you can see the the power being generated from green ammonia the whole the whole cycle um, that's been uh, that's been very influential from a from certainly from a branding and communications perspective the university of minnesota has um, probably the, the most important um, demonstration plant for their wind to ammonia pilot that that started up in 2013 uh, has been the source of now um, well over a decade's worth of, of sort of economics and chemistry um, disciplines focused on, on on what to do with all of, all of those ideas that they've been generating up there. Um, and then uh, you know the the International Maritime Organization is probably the, the biggest inflection point in terms of shifting ammonia as we know it from an idea into a uh, product, uh, and you know they, the, the sort of the sort of uh, startup um, talk with, is always you know uh, what problem are you trying to solve? You know until you have a customer who actually has a problem, your your product's probably not got much of a market, and that that's always been a, a, a an issue for um, ammonia energy until somebody like the global maritime industry comes along and says. Uh, we need a, 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 a carbon-free fuel molecule. Help! <laughs> we can't think of one. And of course, the Ammonia Energy Association says, "Well, uh, we've got some ideas you can you can borrow." Um, so that 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 I think the, the IMO has to be the, the 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 biggest inflection point in terms of, of pushing things to market. So, so speaking of markets, and you mentioned sort of some large niches, from your perspective, what are the major niches that that are a great fit for ammonia energy? Well, um, there's, there's a difference between great fits for ammonia energy and realistic business cases that are that are moving forward. So why don't I talk about the realistic business cases that are actually going to move forward? Um, because the first one I would actually say is <laughs> it's not a great fit on on, on the face of it. Um, but Japan has a has a has a plan to uh, co-fire ammonia in uh, in coal power plants and you know, from a climate perspective, you might think, oh, really? Coal plants? We're gonna we're gonna go there. That that that's that's where we start. And um, uh, it's uh, it's complex. But um, but if you have a, a gigawatt scale coal plant um, and uh, it has a long economic life ahead of it, and you can co-fire with twenty percent ammonia and reduce your carbon emissions by twenty percent next year, well. That that's that's a that's a pretty good result, um, and so that yeah. yeah, so that that that's sort of number one. It's uh it's it's a tough economic case to say you're going to take this, ele uh, this ammonia made from electricity and then make electricity from it. You know, from from an efficiency perspective, it's very lossy. So from an economics perspective, it, it's it, it it's a hard business case to make. But there is a tremendous amount of momentum behind it. You got um, you got plenty of other um, examples. The um, the net zero grid uh, is going to need peaker plants, and so what we what we have is a, a large number of of uh, significant utility companies looking at a um, hundred percent uh, ammonia fed um, 
gas turbines. And when I say 100% ammonia fed, I'm, I'm really talking about a fuel mix of, of sort of 70% ammonia, 30% hydrogen, cracked from 100% ammonia. Um, you've got uh, the diesel genset market, which I think is a, is a really prime opportunity for um, the, the, the specific guys that are working on that are, um, are the alkaline fuel cell manufacturers who are, who are looking to, to, to take on those sort of remote and, and uh, backup generators. You've got, we talked about the maritime fuel market, that, that's a tremendously important uh, opportunity. Um, hydrogen supply, using ammonia as a way of distributing hydrogen. Um, so whether it's a, a question of uh, importing uh, hydrogen into an economy or, or being able to store hydrogen for long periods of time, I think that's, you know, if you think about, um, we, we have things today everywhere called uh, strategic fuel reserves. You look at, uh, you look at uh, a, a power grid, it will have, uh, you'll have a fuel supply of, of, of a minimum like mandated 30 day supply of fuel. Now, how do you do that with a battery? You don't, you can't do it with hydrogen. The boil off would be, would be horrible, but you can do it very, very easily with ammonia. Uh, so these are, these are very important markets um, and obviously uh, fertilizers. You know, we, we, we already have a 180 million ton market um, that needs to decarbonize. Uh, it needs to decarbonize on the trajectory of, of the Paris Agreement. So we've got 30 years to, to, to go from, uh, from zero to 100, essentially, because we've not started. We're, we're just, we're just on, on, on the starting blocks getting ready to uh, demonstrate uh, and deploy. So lots of big opportunities. So, so I think that's a perfect segue, Trevor. Uh, talking about green fertilizers, obviously the key challenge for developing ammonia energy projects is securing offtake contracts and in having customers who are willing to pay. So very, I think I'm sure our audience is very interested in your assessment of the various business cases for ammonia for energy. Well, I think that the, the, the key thing that the, that the business case um, requires is something that we don't have yet, which is certification. Uh, I think that with a certification scheme where you can say this ammonia is um, verifiably zero carbon or low carbon, that allows um, the the producers and the consumers to to demonstrate within their market that they're meeting whatever they need to, whether it's um, uh, a, a grid electricity producer being able to demonstrate a, a carbon intensity per kilowatt hour, or if it's a uh, a, a food company being able to demonstrate um, its uh, it, it, its commitment to low carbon uh, products in a, in a in a consumer marketplace, or if you're a if you're a supplier to to Walmart or PepsiCo, you're able to to demonstrate your your um, carbon intensity reduction to their supply chain projects. Um, that 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 certification to me is 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 the key that that sort of opens up the business case. It, among other things, it, it allows you to demonstrate a, a premium for low carbon ammonia. And in terms of those premiums, Trevor, you know, where are they showing today? Obviously, there is an absence of the certification, so that work needs to be done bilaterally between producers and consumers. But what sort of um, end users, niche markets are we seeing today that actually have uh, market premiums available? Well, the, 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 the maritime sector is going to have to be um, doing some price identification pretty quickly. Um, so there, that, this is really a regulatory driven um, market there where, where, where you've got a very specific um, trajectory of emission reductions um, that are, that are going to be mandated by the IMO. So. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the 30, 30 years away from now, we got that 2050 target of, of a 50% reduction versus their 2008 um, emissions. Um, and so, you know, we're going to have the first um, significant size ammonia vessels on the sea in 2024 or 2025. Uh, we've got the Viking Energy um, that's been announced by, by Icevik and, and um, Equinor, uh, Yara is providing the, the fuel for that from their green ammonia project. 
um, that's going to be that's going to be on, on, on the C2024 they, they they say um, off the top of my head I think that that's a, that's a two megawatt fuel cell and and would consume something on the, on, on the range of like 5,000 tons per year of a month so uh, we're talking fairly small volumes um, but with the Grieg Vartzilla um, announcement last month that they're going to have an ammonia vessel on the sea um, in the same time frame. I'm sure that uh, you know around, around that time we'll have we'll have a number of other projects also. You can you can see the uh, beginnings of of uh, volumes building up for that. On the on the Japanese power plant side, um, a one gigawatt coal fired power plant burning 20% ammonia by energy content. Uh, will consume um, roughly half a million tons of ammonia per year. So uh, Japan's expecting to have one of these operational in, in 2024, 2025. Um, so that's a, that's a half million tons there. They expect to have six operational by 2030. So that, that, that moves up to three million tons per year of uh, uh, low carbon ammonia uh, into that market by, by 2030. So these are, are big numbers. Uh, you've got the the Neom project in Saudi Arabia that uh, that Neom and Aqua Power and Air Products are, are are joint ventures on, and Air Products is doing the offtake um, and delivering that green ammonia uh, into hydrogen markets to to crack it back into hydrogen for um, very high purity PEM fuel cell um, trucks and buses. So that's you know that's another uh, that's 1.2 million tons per year of ammonia there, um, and so you know your 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 demand um, is gonna is gonna be um, some millions of tons, um, but the supply you know if you add in all of the other low carbon ammonia projects that that are already operating you've got you've got um, EOR uh, enhanced oil recovery, um, carbon sequestration projects in in Oklahoma and Louisiana and Alberta. Uh, no shortage of low carbon ammonia projects are already operating. Um, and that, that's going to that's going to increase the the available supply that significantly. So, um, what are the key things that are going to really unlock the potential of these future markets? Both you know the technologies that need to be finalised and developed, and other things like you know certification and policy things. What are the, what are the key things from your perspective? Uh, I mean, we're we're just about to enter a phase where these key things we keep talking about are are no longer going to be questions. They're going to be demonstrated. We're going to have uh, a man's two-stroke engine, Vautzilla's two-stroke engine for the maritime um, sector. Uh, you'll be able to go and kick them. You'll you'll be able to go look at a ship that that runs on them. Um, come back in three years, they'll they'll be on the sea. Um, likewise, uh, co-combustion in a in a coal-fired plant. That's going to be that's going to be happening at gigawatt scale uh, in the next couple of years. Um, ammonia gas turbines a little further away uh, in terms of in terms of large scale um, uh, commercialization. Um, high purity cracking and purification that's definitely one we need to uh, we need to be demonstrating um, at large scale. Obviously, CSIRO and Fortescue and Hyundai are are are, are charging ahead on that one in, in Australia. Um, and uh, they, they, the fuel cell uh, applications are going to be um, very visible uh, in the next couple of years, and that's going to that's going to change things. I think the certification on, on the non-technology side, the certification is a really important issue. Um, and you know, essentially everybody in in all of these different sectors is going to be working on um, safety codes and standards, training, um, environmental. Safety as well as as, as human and and and, and uh, occupational health, um, and and this is really you know this is not a, a question of having to make things up that 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 haven't been um, discovered before. This is really going to be a question of taking the existing codes and standards from um, the agricultural and refrigeration industries and uh, and translating them into these new new areas that the the power sector and the and the maritime sector. So Trevor, there's been a huge amount of effort and activity occurring in the hydrogen and ammonia space globally, uh, yet the AEA has chosen to make Australia the home for its first uh, regional office. Why is that? Well, um, 
about a third of our members. We now have uh, we now have ninety five members uh, as as a industry association around the world, um, and about a third of them are either based or or very active in the Australian market. Um, Australia has a has a great business case here. There's a lot of very high quality renewables um, mixed with a, with a, a a culture in which Australia is an energy exporter. You know, and so you're, you're as a nation, you're looking for um, what, what you know, what, what does that look like in a in a Paris aligned sustainable world? Why? How do you how do you be an energy exporter? Um, and that's what that's what ammonia provides. It provides a pathway to market for renewables and for hydrogen, where you're not consuming things um, immediately and locally. And uh, and so that. That's why Australia. It's a it's a tremendously vibrant area for uh, for development, uh, project development, and, uh, and a large uh, resource trying to find a pathway to market. And ammonia is going to be what unlocks that. So, I mean, how can the Ammonia Energy Association contribute to the development of the ammonia energy industry, particularly particularly in Australia? What is it the A what what is it that the AEA has to give and contribute to this whole process? Well, I mean, there are there are specific pro projects that uh, that we're engaged on um, uh, with our members and with uh, with key stakeholders that are, um, for example, developing that certification scheme that you know, what what that looks like um, to allow uh, ammonia as a renewable energy commodity to be globally traded. Um, but more generally, what you know, what we're what we're doing is we're we're creating connections across regions and across sectors um, to accelerate the process. Um, and uh, essentially, there's a you know a question of demystifying uh, ammonia for for those who aren't already uh, in the ammonia industry uh, and, and helping to helping to to bridge the gaps so that we're we're connecting people across the whole value chain of um, you know from from the renewables through the hydrogen, through the ammonia, through the infrastructure, through the technologies, through to the end users, um, so that everybody can get together. And and, and that essentially is, is a question of uh, reducing risk so that uh, first movers aren't on their own and everybody can can um, work together to, to move in the same direction. And that's that's really what the energy transition is going to is going to require. We're we're trying to we're trying to reduce emissions. We're trying to eliminate emissions, and um, we need to work together to achieve that. Yeah, and of course, the AEA can sort of lift the Australian members out of Australia and connect us with markets and partners and so on internationally as well, which is really valuable. Hmm. Okay, um, so. There have been a, a number of questions um, from the audience. Um, we're almost out of time today, and clearly we're going to come back and r run these events monthly, um, and we can you know, drill into, into questions. But um, Julian, have you got a, a particular question that you want to sort of throw into the mix now while we've got time available? Yeah, sure. Might try and squeeze a couple in. Uh, we've got a question from Andrew Williamson at Arena, the Australian a renewable energy agency and he's asking how Arena's investments in green hydrogen and green ammonia can be best used to accelerate the industry. Who wants a crack at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a crack at that one. Um, I've spent some time with Matt Walden from Arena uh, talking about this. I guess my answer would be uh, I think we've got a great opportunity to choose projects that support uh, and help resolve the critical in uh, issues that are occurring in the scale-up process. So firstly, it's got to be scale. We've got to be supporting and looking to drive bigger projects, 100 megawatt plus electrolysis. We need to be working on projects that you know, help mitigate and demonstrate the supply chain risks. So purchasing scale, sourcing local content, developing local communities. Uh, I think it will be really interesting and we will need to demonstrate uh, the EPC sort of process wrap risks. Uh, so how, you know, who takes the risk on intermittent, uh, intermittent supply and through to the, uh, the end production. And I think we also need to demonstrate the model at scale. So the variable renewables through to uh, ammonia. So uh, I think the selection of which projects can most effectively drive that is the real uh, important step. 
I'd add to that. I think a key enabler for large, particularly uh, green ammonia plants, is large scale hydrogen storage that can buffer the variable upstream with the downstream processes. So, uh, you know, underground storage in salt caverns or underground, you know, in the shafts drilled into the ground and lined. That, that could be something that Australia could really develop and commercialise and can be a key enabler for large plants uh, that are export focused. And, and we might have a, uh, a presentation on that later in the series, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with all these questions, it, it shows areas of interest uh, and things that are very topical that we can drill into in future uh, webinars. Have we got time for another, Julian? I think so, yeah. That's wonderful. Um, the answer about the salt caverns, because that leads very well into the next question from Andrew Fletcher from the Queensland Treasury Corp, who asked about flexibility in the Haber Bosch process and asked about the storage, uh, um, the storage of hydrogen versus salt caverns. Uh, I can have a first crack at that, or Darren, you're keen to jump in? Uh, oh, look, in terms of general flexibility uh, in ammonia plants, uh, it varies very much by technology and technology provider. Um, but it's typically sort of 50 to 65 percent is the minimum turndown you'd expect on ammonia plants. Um, the you know, the relative cost effectiveness of hydrogen storage to support uh, the level of turndown you need for a highly variable um, renewable supply, such as solar only, uh, means that you know, cost effective storage really matters. And I would say that, I mean, clearly, as we're starting to get serious about global decarbonisation, we're applying renewables, which are inherently variable, to, to industrial processes that historically have been fairly baseload. So, you know, uh, Harbour Bosch ammonia synthesis typically is a steady state process. And now we're kind of pimping it and adding a variable input to it. So there's, there's a lot of stuff we need to, uh, to deal with to, to make that work. Hydrogen storage is one of them more turn up turn down is another one um, but there's lots of other ways of dealing with it too but that's the that's the key challenge of our time as we start seriously uh, decarbonizing so i'm going to throw in um, some 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 other ideas this is this is really something that comes from the the project i mentioned earlier in the university of minnesota um, they've they've been operating a green ammonia plant on on a, on a wind turbine for for almost 10 years now and their economics department is having a, having a field day running optimization models on, on, on what an energy system based on, on renewable ammonia looks like. And so if you, you know, if you think, if you think about your, your, your market in, in, in silos, where you're like either you're in the electricity market or you're in the fertilizer market or you're in the fuel production market, then, then you're going to be limited to, to what you're looking at. But if you think about your market in, in terms of what could you do if you had flexibility, if you could be an energy storage asset or a fertilizer producer simultaneously, if you could, um, so, so what, they, what they've been looking at is the optimization of the process. You've got, you've got electricity production, maybe you're using that directly, or maybe you're using it in, in hydrogen production. And then are you using that hydrogen product that hydrogen directly or are you then later upgrading it to ammonia and then are you using the ammonia as a as a product or are you combusting it back into into electricity to to serve a, a, an energy storage um you know grid balancing service uh or you know instead of making ammonia from the hydrogen you're using the hydrogen in combustion for, for grid storage and how do you size your buffer storage for the hydrogen for the batteries for the ammonia tanks and when you start looking at a system that that has that flexibility to generate um, electricity from any one of its different different you know uh, products where any of the, the 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 batteries or the hydrogen or the ammonia and serve all of the different markets that you could with that. So whether it's a, a you know, just grid balancing, whether it's a, an energy storage, there's lots of different markets in just within the electricity market, or whether it's fertilizer production or fuel production, um, it becomes, it becomes a really interesting project to optimize and very, very relevant to the question about what's your turn down, because if you're optimizing it based on, on the uh, physical constraints of your assets, then, um, then that's really where, where you're going to be able to derive the profitability of, uh, of this. Wonderful. I think we might 
wrap it up, Andrew, if that's okay. Yeah, it's good. I mean, clearly there's lots more to discuss. So hopefully, you know, people can join us in future monthly webinars and we drill into all these fascinating topics in a lot more depth. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for coming along. You're our first audience. Uh, thank you very much to the presenters for giving us our time. It was a wonderful session. So coming up next month, we've got Yara, uh, an existing global ammonia producer who has started the transition from making ammonia year making ammonia using natural gas uh, to making ammonia using renewables, uh, including at their plant up in the Pilbara in Western Australia. They've also made a, um, made a major announcement about their expansion into the maritime fuels market. So it should be a very interesting session. Mark it in your diaries. Thursday, March 25th, we'll email everyone who registered for this event and we'll promote it through our usual channels. Uh, so keep an eye out for it. We hope you can attend. Feel free to email us any questions or suggestions you have about ammonia energy, these sessions, and we'll tailor our upcoming webinars accordingly. Thank you, thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time at Ammonia Energy Live. Thank you. <laughs>